You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by MyAx, one of the fastest, most efficient trading platforms in the world. MyAx is proud to bring you Spikes Volatility products. Spikes options and futures are traded on the Spikes Volatility Index, Spike, offering pinpoint accuracy, radically faster dissemination, and a highly transparent settlement auction, all for ultra-low exchange fees. It's volatility reimagined. Learn more about spikes at myaxoptions.com slash spikes. Options and futures involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. The statements made are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied on for financial or legal advice. Volatility Views is also brought to you by Matrix Executions, LLC, an agency broker-dealer focused on best execution in trading workflow automation. A technology-driven firm, Matrix is led by trading pioneers with decades of experience designing and building best-in-class solutions for options markets. Matrix connects to all domestic exchange venues and multiple international exchanges and serves both institutional and individual clients. For more information on Matrix Executions, LLC, please visit MatrixExecutions.com. And now... It's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody. That music means it is Friday. It is noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern. It is time to view some volatility up. It's time for Volatility Views, the premier program. For volatility traders, my name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from this ever-exciting network member. If you like what you hear for this show, anything we do on the network, which is pushing a dozen freaking shows there, then keep rating and reviewing our stuff. Wherever you find this content, it does help the slew of new people who are discovering the options and volatility markets every day find their way to our doorstep. Go keep those questions and comments coming, too. We do love to hear from you guys let's see who we're hearing from today first holding down the matrix hot seat this week deep deep in the heart of texas we are joined once again by the greasiest of meatballs mr mark sebastian from optionpit.com by way of carmen line capital by way of a robin hood trade near you mr meatball welcome back to the program sir it's great to be here i'm i love sitting in the matrix hot seat it's my favorite seat to be hot in <laughs> yes, you can now you, in the middle of the shot means you can turn around and just put up some uh, 10,000 lots in SPX while you're waiting out there. You know, the good thing to keep you active, keep you busy during the show here. Tubby might be a little jealous, but <laughs> you'll be busy nonetheless. And also joining us, holding down the MyX hot seat, I am pleased to say joining us for the first time here in 2021, the quiet, tranquil year that so far has been 2021. 
Mr. Russell Rhodes from Loyola University by way of EQ Derivatives, by way of a VIX book or two near you. Mr. Rhodes, welcome back to the program. And can I finally legally call you Dr. VIX or is that still on the horizon, sir? It's very close on the horizon. Very, very close. Next time I'll be next time I'll be here, you can call me Dr. Vick. I will continue to refer to you as the once and future Dr. Vix. How does that sound? Once and future. I like that. <laughs> All right, as we keep on rolling right on into the volatility review. It's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world. It's time for the volatility review. All right, everybody, let's get to it. Let's set the table here for our volatility review. Coming into showtime, not even a pretty weak jobs number. It seems like it can derail the green on the screen for very long. Most of the major indices, once again, firmly in the green today. S&P up about half a percent. Dow up about a third of a percent. NASDAQ, once again, leading the charge up about two-thirds of a percent. And all this green today and for most of the week, means vol has pretty much been annihilated since our last show. If you listened to the show last week, you know myself and the Rock Lobster, we were feeling vol coming off, not quite to this extent. So I don't think any of our crystal balls, unless there's a big surge in volatility throughout the course of this next hour, I don't think any of our crystal balls are going to be coming within our threshold of victory. Because coming into showtime, we had spikes at about a little bit north of 21 half, about 2165. That puts it down over 13 handles, 13 and a half handles. From where it was this time last week, listeners. So yeah, technical technical term is that's a drubbing out there. VIX, same deal. It was about 21 coming into showtime. That puts it down about 14 and a quarter points from where it was this time last week. So that's a lot of juice, a lot of air coming out of that balloon. And VIX, our old friend, the Vol of Vol, coming down pretty hard as well. About 107 and a half coming into showtime. That puts it down, oh, about 35 and a half points from last show. So not much really to unpack so let's get there but before we dive into all things vix and macro volatility mr once in future dr vix this is your first time on the network here in this new year that is 2021 and i'm not sure if you noticed but a few things have popped off in the market since the last time you and i chatted so let's start there i haven't had a chance to pick your brain on this this big macro mega volatility event known as GameStop and all the related madness therein. You know, we had an underlying going from 5 bucks to 20 bucks to 500 We had Val going from a few percent to 300% to over a 1,000% and then doing size at that volatility. I mean, things that from a volatility perspective, I certainly haven't seen before. So I'm curious for you, give us your thoughts here on this entire mad debacle of volatility that was GameStop and this related short squeeze phenomenon, sir. So uh, I could spend the whole hour on this. Uh, <laughs> you have six minutes. Go. <laughs> I, I at the most, I figure six minutes. Well, I mean, first off, the the volatility that we saw on GameStop. I, you know, I think the most that I had seen before this was maybe like a two or three hundred percent number on a biotech company that had a make or break announcement or something like that. Uh, I, I just do not ever recall. Uh, and I never saw a thousand percent, but yeah, probably had, I, I, I think the, the highest number I saw on the close was like in the five or 600%, but you know, what does it matter? That's still absolutely ridiculous. Uh, I do think there was a carryover into the rest of the markets. Uh, we, you, you had to have some people raising cash, uh, we're still trying to find out if any more hedge funds got hurt by the GameStop thing. Uh, you know, you're not real quick to report your month in numbers when they're not all that good. What I find absolutely fascinating is what didn't happen in silver. Uh, you know, the, the attempted short squeeze in silver really cracked me up. Uh, they, they, it's not the same as GameStop. Uh, there are lots of other ways to get exposure to silver. H heck, you can buy a, an ETF that gives you short exposure to silver. Uh, and, uh, you know, there, there's futures markets. There are lots of ETFs. So, I, you know, the, the coordinated attempt to squeeze silver, I thought, was pretty humorous. But beyond that, if you're going to – this is a lesson for everybody. 
if you're going to orchestrate a squirt, short squeeze, don't tell people it's coming. It's like, you know, if I want to sneak up on one of my kids and scare the crap out of them, I don't give them a note saying uh, in 10 minutes, I'm going to burst into your room to see what you're doing and scare the crap out of you. Um, you don't telegraph these things. And then finally, in the space that we're supposed to be talking about here, uh, this has prompted, uh, I, I think, one Wall Street firm actually put a report out talking about how this could be a possibility in the volatility space. And, and I think... Uh, looking back to 2018, a, a lot of people look at what happened, you know, on the close in early February uh, 2018. In fact, are we on the anniversary of that? I can't remember the exact date. The exact date. But yes, today was, is the anniversary. Is today it? Is I know it was. Yes. I know it was in the first week. But you've got such an ecosystem for volatility that stretches beyond what we see, even stretches into the over-the-counter market. That, that I just don't see that being orchestrated. And the thing that happened in 2018 was, you know, a, a kind of an operational deal between 3 o'clock Chicago time and 3.15 Chicago time. That can't happen anymore because they've, they've changed the way that they go about determining the closing prices of VIX futures. So we wouldn't see a repeat of that one. But that wasn't a short squeeze. I think that was more of um, an, unante an unanticipated operational event. So I just, well, you know, I, I just don't Ru see it repeating in a Russell, macro market. I would, one yeah. thing I would, I wanted to kind of throw out is, you know, it was kind of like the opposite of a short squeeze, right? You actually, X, you look at XIV and SBXY, you had know, all, all these firms piling into short vol and then yeah. it got kind of squeezed the other way when the, the trade started to turn. Right. And then you had the, basically the, and this, it, it, it was I think you're breaking up a little bit there, Mark. So let's see if we can let's see if we can get him back from deep in the heart of Texas there. But Mr. Rhodes, you bring up an interesting point about the whole notion that, you know, uh, people people I heard a lot of people ascribing the same things that you were about silver, about about how it was somehow the same setup as GameStop, heavily shorted and deeply illiquid, which if you know anything about the silver market is patently false. And yeah, making the same allegations about the VIX market, which again, nowhere near the same beast. Yeah, people were trying to take the same mold and apply it to products and to markets where it doesn't fit. So I'm not surprised to hear that you were hearing some of that as well. Mr. Meatball there, are you back, sir? Are you back from wherever the technology gods threw you? Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. Um, so it was, yeah, what I was saying was that, you know, it was definitely an operational squeeze, but you almost had so many people piled into a, a short vol uh, trade that when it started to go the other way, it got squeezed in, in 15 minutes instead of uh, over a couple of days. And, and so it, it was a, a crowded trade that, that operationally squeezed itself. And if you looked at that like half hour of trading, that that's very similar to what happened in GameStop, but for totally different reasons and and not like a coordinated Reddit thing. It was just a you had too many people piled into a vol market that didn't understand what they were buying, and that and it went the other way, and and the Taz the traded subtle ate ate itself, which. <laughs> is just a, an absolutely crazy thing. Um, and you had firms that were like, fine, eat yourself. I don't care. Mm -hmm. And, and that was, that was why I, I, I do see some similarities there, but, but they've done a lot of, like you said, a lot of those operational fixes and that market has gotten even bigger. And, mm -hmm. and at, at this point, especially right here with the VIX in the twenties, you know what, go ahead and try and bid. I would love if they did that so I could just fade the crap out of them. Because that that vol doesn't hang out and stay high like uh, like like a stock can for a, a period of time. It would have been uh, uh, and 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 most firms are positioned long. Any you know the real firms are positioned long. So there's some similarities. I get why people would make it, but make those analogies. But it, as you stated, totally different, and and occurred for entirely different reasons. But yes, happy vol volumageddon anniversary. Yeah, we, I guess lost in the madness that was this February, what happened right back in 2018, that was Valmageddon, where we, we saw the vol market ripped apart. We saw 
beloved products or perhaps much maligned products like XIV go the way of the Dodo. We saw UVXY and SVXY get neutered after hours in the wake of all of this. A lot of fun stuff that we're kind of still dealing with the ramifications of right now. But back to this notion you just made earlier, Russell, which is kind of fascinating of the notion of putting together a short squeeze in something like VIX. You just think about the capital that would be involved in something like that. Think about the notional volume that goes up and the vega that goes up every day in VIX and, of course, in SPX from whence it is derived, you know, the biggest notional value product on the planet. And, and then think about, you know, even if all the Redditors in the world came at it, <laughs> how much they could take down and, and laugh a lot of this off. So that would be certainly be a fascinating subject for an analysis. I do believe you have done, am I correct, once in future, Dr. Vicks, have you not done an analysis of a quote-unquote Vicks short squeeze, sir? Um, yeah, I, I, we, we've started doing short videos at EQ Derivatives and. Uh, the one that I put out there yesterday, I just I, I listed out most of the reasons that we just listed out as to why I don't think a uh, a VIX short squeeze could work itself out. Uh, you know, I, I checked the the short interest. The short interest on VXX right now is only 10 percent of average daily volume. It's le- it's a sh- smaller percent. It's 4 million shares. There's 64 million outstanding right now. You know, and another thing is. And I don't understand why GameStop didn't do this. I think maybe it's because they're in their quiet period. GameStop had a shelf registration where they could have sold shares. Yes, we debated that. Mark and I debated that last. That, to me, is the most um, flummoxing thing of all of this. They were handed a lifeline Yeah. by the market to save a struggling company, and they didn't take yeah. it. I'm, I'm stunned by that. Well, you know, their quarter end is the last day of January, so it's very, very possible that they were in a period of time where they weren't allowed to sell shares. That's horrible. <laughs> that's that's the only either that either that or there's a reason that company's going out of business because they don't know how to run a public company. Yeah, if it is the latter, then you're right. They they need to go the way of the dodo because they were handed a gift from the market gods and they chose let's not take it, let's not drink from this delicious ambrosia that was handed to us by these redditors and instead go our own separate way. So we could talk about all the GameStop madness for the rest of the show, as Mr. Rhodes alluded to it, and it is indeed. The great volatility event of our day right now, certainly. Uh, so that's that's inarguable out there. But let's get to where we are right now from a overall macro volatility perspective. Uh, Mr. Meatball, we'll start with you. As I just mentioned, they came for the vol and they came for it pretty hard this week off well over 10 handles across all of the major vol products out there right now. So what's been lighting up your tape over there in the land of the pit from a vol perspective this week, sir? You know, what's funny is if you took a picture of the VIX curve from two Fridays ago overlaid it against the VIX curve today. It's like the, what happened last week never happened. They're, they're right back. We're right back to where we started. If anything, the VIX is actually a little bit lower. Uh, it, it, there's still a, a really, a really big underlying bid in VIX futures where they just don't seem to want to come off. Uh, you know, the Fed future is still what 24 and a half, which, and the uh, and while the VIX is is sub 21, so you've got a a, a Mack truck wide uh, spread there. But yeah, it's almost like it never happened. Uh, the the speed with which we've just gone right back to normal. Gotta love that old VIX curve. Yeah, that got pretty crazy, pretty juicy out there. I think it's a technical term for a little bit. We'll get to all that in a second. Mr. Rhodes, same question for you, sir. They obviously came for the vol, and they came for it pretty hard. This week, what are your thoughts on this uh, mini Volmageddon we're having this week, sir? Mini Volmageddon, I like that. You know, we might be getting close to uh, not a whole lot of concerns for the next few months, which is something you can't say when you look at the curve. Uh, it's still a little flat, but the whole thing has come down uh, you know, uniformly. In fact, it was it was kind of a hump shape when you went out to I want to say March, April, and then it kind of tailed off through the summer and I kept we we were we have our own little internal research calls and we were like what is, is there something coming in March that uh, is causing VIX to be elevated around then but that that little anomaly has gone away so um you know maybe maybe we're getting ready to get back into a normal uh, volatility environment yeah you know Russell we've been uh, executing a bunch of your favorite trade uh we've been doing uh in the money puts spreads short uh you know long a put in like 
April, short May, long March, short April, uh, long, a- you know, long April, mm-hmm. short, short uh, May, long May, short June, just because the curve has been so flat that if you're patient, uh, it eventually falls down that hill. Mm-hmm. And uh, those spreads have done really well. Uh, another, another Russell Rhodes classic. Uh, the Feb, I, Andrew, um, Andrew Giovinazzi, the Rathal officer, and I were looking today. Uh, the 24 puts are $1.60, while the, tw- uh, the VIX itself is, in Feb, while the VIX itself is, is sub-21, you could buy the put, and if nothing happened, VIX doesn't have to go down. If nothing happened, you made like a buck forty on on the on the play. It, it just the, the if you're willing to to say, hey, VIX isn't going back to twenty three or twenty four for a little bit, uh, and and if anything, it might go down. There is a ton of opportunity in the VIX curve itself right now. Is there is there any macro? Uh, known unknown between now and February. I mean, today would have been one with the employment number, I guess. But I, I just, I don't. There's not, there's not a Fed meeting. There's no, what's, why are the February futures so elevated right now? Is it a, like a COVID thing? Like they're still worried about COVID? Know. Is it We're, a, uh, it is it just a a recency bias? Right, vol's been so high. Maybe they're just afraid to really let it let it die. Um, and, uh, with the market going up, like it's been going up, is it worth it to just be long of its future and, and eat a little bit of contango to be long a bunch of S and P and, and have that as a profitable trade that you've lost money on VIX for the last six months. But if you did it <laughs> as a hedge against a long S and P, you came out way and ha- way, mm-hmm. way, way ahead. Uh, I mean, maybe it's just lack of sellers. <laughs> yes. I mean, no, I know that sounds kind of silly, but, you know, t- no, typically when you've got, you know, a normal looking curve like we have right now, you'll have people that want to play that, um, you know, play the, the rolling down the hill, as, as Mark put it. But, uh, you know, the better way to, I've always said, and you already mentioned it, the better way to go about doing it really, I think, is buying a put in in this environment, especially when there's, you know, as wide a spread there is. And it's uh, it's it's helping out with the time value in that put. Uh, it's just a safer way to go about doing it. So and if you're buying puts and the uh, you know, the market maker is, you know, selling your puts. Uh, you'd think that would help with the futures, but I guess not. Guess not, indeed. Let's look at that curve and see exactly what we're talking about, because you're right, Mark. It is like we just kind of photocopied it from a couple of weeks ago and pasted it on here. If you listen to last week's show, we were talking about how the everything was getting crazy backward. That cash was off on its own planet relative to the futures. Well, it has come back in dramatically this week, as you might imagine. No longer backward. In fact, uh, that Feb future coming into showtime was about exactly a three-point premium to the cash that's a almost five point four and a half handle swing from its distance to the cash last week give you a sense of how much that cash is just bouncing all over the place hither and yon march future is about five and a half points premium to the cash coming to show that. that's a seven and a half point swing so that front portion of the curb was in crazy town last week and now it's starting to come back you get a little bit farther out again you get out into may even april april down the way out to august and beyond you gotta kind of get that plateau effect again everything's kind of just hanging out around a 28 and doesn't really want to budge uh, so we're still hanging out there that hasn't changed but in the front portion of the curve things are a little bit quieter you know what else hasn't really changed much is the spikes overall top positions from an options perspective the futures trading some volume over there the curve looking pretty similar out there right now and the options still dominated over there the top positions by the that vertical versus puts the feb 32 half 40 vertical versus the feb 29 puts of course that went up a thousand times recently out there that's still dominating the spikes tape out there let's get on out to vixland and see what's lighting it up for ourselves out there coming into well as of a few minutes ago actually vix was doing some paper not a ton but a decent amount nonetheless we have about oh a little bit just a tick north of a quarter of a million contracts on the tape right now it puts it pretty much exactly 400,000 contracts actually the adv is 654 right now so that adv has ticked up quite a bit but it's going to be a challenge to catch that today given the somewhat anemic paper we're seeing out there from a VIX options 
perspective. Let's break down what the size positions are out there right now. The top 10 then. If Mr. Once in the Future Dr. Vix wants to uh, wants to feel his oats, perhaps we can have a revisit of an earlier segment from the show. But before we get to that, let me buy him some time by breaking down the top 10 positions out there in Vix options land. Number 10, cost you 152,000 contracts to break into the top 10 in Vix land now, which isn't a ton, quite frankly. That gets you to the Feb 50s, 156,000 for the Feb doubles. That's that funky kind of tight vertical we were talking about earlier on the show. It's still open and it's still there for size. Number eight, 178,000 of that Feb 18 puts. A lot of Feb and a lot of puts here on the list. Only three calls really in the top 10 and we just did two of them. <laughs> Number seven, 179,000 of the March 21 puts. Number six, 184,000 of the Feb 17 puts. Number five, a buck 92 of the March 17 puts. So folks liking that 17 strike. Number four, 202,000 of the Feb 20 puts. Number three, 208,000 of the Feb 15 puts. Number two, 237,000 of the Feb 60 calls. The only other call on our list. If you're wondering what call strikes are open for size, it's the 50, 55, and 60 strikes in February, listeners. Put those in your pipe and smoke it. Number one with a bullet, 354,000 contracts of the Feb 21 puts. Total of about 8.5 million contracts open right now, about 4.2 million on the calls, and about 4.3 million on the puts. So puts actually just ever so slightly edging out calls out there right now. Now, Mr. Rhodes, before I dive in to all the madness that unfolded in VIX options this week, what say you we have a little bit of a revisit of an old segment from the past? You up for it, sir? I'm totally up for it. All right, then. Without further ado, then, it is time for Russell's Weekly Rundown. Now, Russell's Weekly Rundown. Uh, The real reason I do that segment, listeners, is just to hear that drop. We don't get to hear it often enough. All right, Mr. Rhodes, have at it, sir. The floor is yours. The floor is mine. I'm still trying to find the freaking trade that I wanted to talk about. Uh, Because somebody did do something in the uh, with the February 10 options that expire uh, next week, February 10th. I think they and I'm doing this for memory because I'm really am searching around for where I had written this down. Uh, I think somebody did. uh, I want to say an 18, 21, 23 put spread, something like that. But again, I am. You gave me time, and I still didn't find it quite yet. Uh, see, I'm hoping. See, usually Mark Sebastian will just jump right in, and he's not helping me here. Mark, help me. I'm well, usually, you know, I, yeah, I'm, I'm usually yeah. much more of a professional than this. Hold on, I think I found it. So, um, <laughs> uh, all right, I was about to pop in and, and tell people. I got that. it. I got it. Oh. I got it. I got it. Right. Okay, somebody bought. 500 of the February 10th, 30 puts sold a thousand of the February 10th, 25 puts and bought 500 of the February 10th, 20 puts. Uh, they paid 270 for each put spread and they're not looking particularly hot right now. Cause we've overshot to the downside on this one, but it was, it would have been pretty good at expiration at weekly expiration next week between 2270 and, and 27.30. And like I said, I think we're a little bit lower than that right now. That future is still around 23. So there is just an amazing amount of juice. I mean, Russell, you can buy the 22 puts expiring next week for about 40 cents. And the VIX is sub 21. The, uh, the you know, just looking here, the, you know, the 21 puts are going to be about a dime. That, that to me seems too cheap. The, uh, you know, if, if you want to get clever, you could try and do like the, the 22, 21, 20 put fly. Uh, there, there, there is just edge of plenty in the, the, the weekly that expires on Wednesday. So if you think that, uh, we're, we're the, the water is calm, time to hop in cause the water is fine. Then, um, I'm looking at that, at that weekly and saying, that's looking a little a little appetizing. Don't, don't you almost feel like we're missing something? I, I kind of do. I mean, the mispricing looks so – Yeah, I, I tell beginner option traders, if, if you think you just saw an arbitrage opportunity, you're missing something. 
And right. the, the, I don't know, just the futures premium. And it could, I, I liked your recency bias idea because I do think that's probably what it is. Um, but it just seems like the futures are at too much of a premium. Let's get to what's lighting it up on the media side. By the way, I like that that fly, but you're right. It's a little bit past the uh, the strike where it would have done the most good for him out there. Your cohort there, the Rock Lobster, has to be smiling, Mr. Meatball, he's been looking at this 21 strike uh, for a while here. We are a little bit shy of it in the cash. Obviously, the futures still have a ways to go, but at least a symbolic victory for him nonetheless because he's been bemoaning the fact that it can't break the 21 handle <laughs> for the entirety of this year pretty much. So maybe he'll have a bit of a symbolic smile on his face wherever the Rock Lobster is right now in his palatial compounds. Get on out there, see what's lighting it up. Like I said, today, not a ton of paper, about a quarter of a million contracts on the tape. The most active contract, 30,000 of the March 22 puts followed by much less. Number two, the March 23 puts for about 13, almost 14,000. The Feb 45 calls back to the call side with some the strike selections on the calls are, shall we say, interesting. Uh, 12,000 of these bad boys on the tape. Number four, March 21 puts 12,000 as well. And round out the top five most active contracts today, 10,000 of the March 20 puts. All right, let's go on to yesterday. A little bit more paper on the tape on Thursday. 629,000 contracts hitting the tape. Number one was the Feb 23 puts, 39,000 of those. Also, 39,000 of the Feb 21 puts. So maybe a nice little tight vertical going up there. Number three, we got 24, almost 25,000 of the Feb 45 calls. Back to those interesting strikes on the upside in February. Number four, June 35 calls. That's interesting. Farther out, And perhaps more reasonable than a lot of the strikes we've been seeing out there of late. So that's an interesting one. 20,000 of the Feb 35, or excuse me, June 35. So I'll have to dig into those a little bit more after the show. And about 20,000 as well for number five of the Feb 30 call. So it's not all insane upside. It's just mostly insane upside when they're trading the calls. Wednesday, 441,000 contracts on the tape. The most active contract back to the crazy calls. 33,500 of the Feb 75 calls. So at 50, the doubles, the 60s, those weren't optimistic enough for your blood. Well, here you go. 33,000 of the Feb 75s on the tape on Wednesday, followed by number two, 23,000 of the Feb 40 calls. Number three, 22,000 as well of the Feb doubles. All calls all the time on Wednesday. Number four, 20, almost 21,000 of the June 15 puts. Of, uh, puts finally sneaking in there. And number five was 15, almost 16,000 of the Feb 24 put. Tuesday, The Devil's Day, 666,000 contracts on the tape. The most active contract that day, nearly 40,000, a tick under 40,000 of the Feb 25 puts, followed by 32,500 of the Feb 23 puts, 30, almost 31,000 of the Feb 26 puts, 25,000 of the March 23 puts, and number five there, 23,000 of the Feb 24 puts. So a nice Hefty dose of puts there on Tuesday. Not exactly surprising, given what we saw Vol doing earlier in the week. Monday was the big dog day this week. 810,000 contracts on the tape. And they were coming for the puts that day as well. 62, almost 63,000 of the Feb 21 puts. 52,000 of the Feb 24 puts. 46,000 of the Feb 18 puts. 36, almost 37,000 of the Feb 60s. And 27,000 of the Feb double calls. Back to those funky call strikes everybody loves so much. Mr. Meatball, what are your thoughts outside of uh, Mr. Rhodes's weekly butterfly there? What are your thoughts on some of the paper hitting the VIX options tape this week? Any of this stuff really resonate to you? Perhaps even these, shall we say, funky upside calls, sir? Yeah, there's been a lot of, uh, the, you know, the, the trades have not been your standard. Uh, we haven't seen the giant 100,000 lot and 200,000 lots that or even 50,000 lots, but there's been a lot of like, you know, odd 17,000 lot, you know, weird put combos or things like that. Yeah. It's been, the paper has been a lot harder to follow the last month or so than uh, I'm, I'm used to just because uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's coming in 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 odd ways, but uh, you know, I, I, I expect, one thing I will say is that uh, that 23 19 put spread buyer got out at some of the worst pricing that I've ever seen. Uh, you know, that he got out at a nickel. He sold his 23 puts at a nickel. Um, and I think I saw maybe he got out of some, uh, he or she got out of some at you know, like 18 cents 
And those 23 puts are right back to over a dollar. Um, so, you know, that, that big, huge, uh, fab put buyer, uh, bail that at the absolute top of the market. That's rough. A nickel for those. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> I've seen some bad, uh, bad executions, but that one's going to come back to haunt them a little bit. Let's see what's haunting people out there in VXX land. If you were one of those really betting on a new upside regime in VXX, you were loving that over 20 time and you were thinking we had more upside to come. Well, then perhaps this was a sad face week for you. For everyone else out there who loves to fade this thing, you got it in spades this week. 16 and a half coming into showtime. And it's still pretty much 16 and a half right now. Puts it down about exactly four points from where it was this time last show. So that's a whole heck of a lot of juice coming out of VXX. But then again, when we describe what was going on out there in Vixland this week, probably not a surprise that they squeezed that much air out of the balloon. A lot of paper going up in VXX out there as well. That Today's 234,000 contracts on the tape already. The ADB is looking strong out there. 345,000 contracts is the ADB right now for VXX. Up another 32,000 from last week. So go figure. A good four-handle Click of erosion is gonna gonna kick in some folks trading this product. Almost two million contracts open out there right now, total as well in VXX. So it's getting pretty hefty out there. Let's look at the top ten sizable positions out there in VXX right now. Number ten cost you almost twenty one thousand contracts to break into the top ten, which obviously is not much next to VIX, but for VXX that's getting up there twenty thousand seven hundred. That gets you to the March forty calls. By the way, there are only three calls in the top ten this week. So those of you who are banking on some upside. Not a lot of friends out there this week. Number nine, 20, almost 21,000 of the March 13 puts. Number eight, 21,000 of the Feb 13 puts. Number seven, our second of three calls in the top 10, 21,800 of the Feb 20s. Number six, 23,800 of the Feb 14 puts. Number five, 25,700 of the March 14 puts. People just like these strikes. Number four, 31, almost 32,000 of the March 15 puts. Number three, 37,000 of the Feb 16 puts. I think you can see where we're going. Number four, I want to say number two, 40,000 of the March 16 puts. Actually, interestingly enough, though, the number one size position in VXX right now are the March 20s. Good for 71,300 out there, which is kind of fascinating. So I'll have to dig into that one as well a little bit and see what exactly is up with the 20 strike? Do we break through it? And someone says, hey, this is undone. Maybe it's the same guy out there who's loading up on the Feb 50 double. <laughs> And Vix, he's also deciding to pick up all the 20s in the room out here. Either way, 71,000 of those bad boys open right now. That's almost 2x the number two position out there. So there's some size on the 20 strike in March right now. In terms of what's lighting it up today, I said a decently active day. The most active trades out there today, the Feb 16 half puts going up. These expire on the 5th, so today. So these are the weeklies. 14, almost 15,000 of those. Feb 17 calls going out today, about 12,500. The Feb weekly is going out today as well. 17 puts, 6,600. Number four, 6,000 of the March 20. So back to that March 20 strike again. And number five, 5,700 of the Feb expiring today, 17 half calls. By the way, our buddy Famous Dave, he's been listening. He likes to watch his VXX all week. And he's always hitting us up with his trade alerts <laughs> for what's going on out there in VXX land. He had a couple on his radar this week, including Tuesday. He, he noted, which is kind of interesting, the March 22 straddle. Traded 10,000 times, he said, the customer buying it for $7.40. If you're wondering, he says that's 110 volatility on that bad boy with a 20 delta. Obviously, that delta is to the puts, so the puts are over on that one. That's kind of it, 740. That's, that's an interesting price. And then we have uh, on the next day, on Wednesday, he profiled customer buying 10,000 of the Feb 16 puts, paying 28 cents. That one's looking kind of interesting now as well. Mr. Meatball, what are your thoughts on what's going on in VXX on the crazy erosion we saw out there this week, as well as some of the trades going up, including maybe this March 22 straddle for 740, sir? Yeah, you know, that was uh, definitely an interesting one. I, I get why you would do that, right? You're thinking VXX by March, it's either going to be, you know, talking about reverse splitting or it's going to be like 50. Uh, at, at the time of that trade, and and uh, you know, it looks like it's going to be more the uh, more the former. Uh, you know, we saw a, a big a couple of, of trades like that. Um, yeah, lots of fade trades getting set up. Uh, VXX looks like it wants to go to its all time low, which would be about sixteen bucks. 
and and maybe keep going from there if we do get any follow through in the VIX futures. Uh, there is still plenty of downside with how much Contango there is in um, in VXX, and I would add that you know Contango's wide, but it's it's wide between the VIX and, and the future. But the the spread between the Fab and the expansion, I, I found in the past that uh, tracking Contango expansion and contraction is is really the best way to momentum play VXX even more than the actual, uh, you know, the actual future spreads themselves. Are they expanding? Are they contracting? And that's the the way to trade back and forth in these ETPs. Mr. Rhodes, I know you've been busy looking at short squeezes in VIX and GameStop and Silver, but what are your thoughts here on what's going up in VXX, including this, uh, some might say juicy, others might say fairly priced straddle out here in VXX, sir? Yeah, well, you know, the the funny thing about buying a straddle in VXX, it's it's almost like a risk reversal if you think about it, where you, you, if you keep getting the grind lower, 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 uh, some of that, that call premium is going to be paid for by what you'll make off of the put. Uh, whereas, you know, if you get a big old spike to the upside, hopefully uh, everything's going to be covered by... Uh, you know, the whole cost is going to be covered by that big move to the upside. So it's one of those trades that you normally would do because you think there's going to be a big move in one direction or another. We don't get big moves to the downside. So you would, you know, you, I, I think you, you do something like that with the hope that the grind lower covers, covers some of the cost, but not all of the cost, but gives you the ability to, um, <clears throat> benefit to the upside. I was just looking at where we were this time last year before everything took off. And VXX was actually uh, on February 5th, a year ago, uh, it was at 1420. So after everything that we have been through, um, we're only up, you know, about $2 and 30 cents, about 15% uh, in VXX over the course of, of course of a year, of course of a very volatile and historic year. So I like having you on, sir. You bring the historic data perspective. I think you're right, because the, the worm was about to turn. It was around February 20th where things really started to get dire for the market out there. And that's when we saw vol ticking up, BXX ticking up. We're now back close, spitting distance of that range. Listen, what do you guys think of that straddle? 740. On the one hand, it might sound juicy. On the other hand, you're really just paying for that put at that point, right? And you might argue you might see those levels <laughs> pretty soon. So interesting stuff afoot out there in VXX. Also interesting stuff afoot in the single name volatility. Sometimes with the madness of everything else going on, it's hard to remember that it's actually earnings season. In fact, that shows how crazy the, the GameStop madness was last week. We had the same day we had Tesla and we had uh, Apple and we had a Fed meeting. None of that mattered. Nobody gave a crap about any of that. <laughs> I think Facebook was that same day as well. Everyone was fixated on a ailing video game retailer. That shows how mad things are. Things are still kind of interesting out there in the vol space from an earnings perspective. Again, if you want these reports for yourselves, earnings move, earnings move result, earnings season, you know where to go, theoptionsider.com. Click on that options news and articles tab. You get all this data courtesy of our friends over there at Or. Land. You can't beat the price. It's free. Uh, so Tuesday, we had Amazon. We had Alphabet. We had Pfizer. We had EA, Alibaba, BP, UPS, a bunch on Tuesday. Wednesday, we had Spotify, PayPal, Qualcomm, eBay, Grubhub. But yesterday, we had Merck. We had Activision, Blizzard, Peloton. Interesting one out there as well, as well as WWE. Looks like they're taking a shellac in here in, in the early hours. So I guess the street didn't like what, what Vince and co had to say out there. Let's look at some of the earnings Move results reports that we have hot off the presses with some of these names for yesterday and the day before. Qualcomm, they're on the third. They were priced, let's see, they were at 162 and about a half going into their announcement. They're pricing in 5.8%. They actually delivered 10%. So one of the rare names to outperform their earnings straddle, so outperform from an earnings vol perspective. Let's see if any others followed suit. eBay, 58, pretty much even going into their announcement. They were expecting 6.6% vol. They delivered 5.3%. So Yet another in the want wah category there. PayPal, 251, almost 252. They were pricing in 6.4%, and they delivered a whopping 4.3%. So yet another one where buying the juice, no bueno here. And then Grubhub, they were earlier this week as well, 74, 79 going into their announcement. They were pricing in a whopping 10.3%. So they were looking for some, some juice, and they delivered 3.7%. <laughs> so yeah, not so much there. 
on the earnings season re, earnings results report. If you're wondering about the season, by the way, yeah, it's it's blood red. It's looking pretty bad so far. Week one, fifty three percent in terms of bang for your buck right now. So if you a hundred percent is you got exactly the move in the straddle that you paid for fifty three percent. You're getting about half of the move that you're paying for out there this week. Not much better, fifty six percent out there. So so far, another blood red season out there. Doesn't you thought maybe this was the the cycle where the worm was starting to turn? There was maybe a bit of an inflection point. Maybe they had hammered these earnings straddles so much that just by momentum, by inertia, some names should start art performing. And yet it's not what we're seeing at all out here. By the way, if you wonder what's being priced in for the future, we got a lot more reports coming up for next week. Big names, HP and Lyft on the ninth, as well as Twitter. And Yelp, let's look at a couple of these really quick. Let's look at Twitter. Let's see, they're $54.5 bucks as of this report. They were pricing in $5.92. In the past, they moved six forty. dollars So they got the memo out there in Twitter, a little bit less juice. Lyft, $49.5. bucks. they were pricing in four ten. dollars In the past, they've moved four ten. dollars So there you go, exactly in line. They're starting to get it out there. Let's see, Yelp, $35.25 as of this report. They were pricing in three seventy three. dollars In the past, they moved four twenty one. dollars So there we go. Past his prologue out there. Folks are starting to, to squeeze this vol a little bit more. Uber, 57.12. They're popping off on the 10th. They were pricing in $4.18. In the past, they moved 4 17 There we go. It's, it's starting to make sense out there. And our old friend Zynga, we've been talking about this one a lot on the option block. Someone's been coming for those calls for size. Spoiler alert, didn't work out too well. Uh, this, this, as of this report, it was 10 26 I believe someone had traded 45,000 of the 11 calls recently, and all those went away worthless. Uh, let's see. They're pricing in 71 cents. In the past, they moved 41 cents. So we'll see if that one will play out. A lot more. Check out Disney coming up. Now, really quick. Disney, 176 and a half. What a crazy price. If you had told me at the beginning of the year they would shut down most of their parks for a good chunk of the year, there'd be no Marvel or big Disney movies coming out for the entirety of the year. Live sports would be gone. ESPN would be having massive layoffs. And yet they'd launch this little streaming service. And because of that, the stock would be up, oh, 76% on the year. I would have said you're an insane person. But hey, these are markets for insane people, as Uncle Mike likes to say. All right. Uh, they're pricing in $8.82. In the past, they moved four sixty. So that one's looking pretty rich. So if past is prologue, that may come out not so good out there. Mr. Rhodes, I know you watch a little bit of single name vol. So what's lighting up your tape from an earnings vol perspective, sir? You just blew up what I was going to say. Um, what I was actually going to say is it seems like uh, just about, uh, you know, all the straddles or, or all the option markets seem to be uh, pricing in, you know, within or below historical uh, moves. And and I was going to say that, you know, we are about halfway, a little bit over halfway through earnings season. And we haven't seen any giant, you know, any giant movers you know anybody that was short volatility going into um you know earnings usually it seems like every day we have one or two that that had some sort of big outlier move and we're just not seeing that at least so far in this earnings season but then the last one you bring up is pricing in a double um relative to history so uh we'll see yeah we will see indeed let's see what else you guys have on your brains it is time to check the volatility voicemail it's time to share your thoughts and opinions with your fellow volatility traders. It's time to check the volatility voicemail. Make your voice heard by dialing 779-669-4VOL, posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com, or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options or facebook.com slash the options insider all right let's get to it here we got a big poll out there right now you guys have been venting your spleen about all things gamestop and related impacts for a while we have another poll out there check the results some of the other ones we broke down earlier this week about what you guys thought about overpricing out of the money calls about uh, the lasting impact of gamestop we have a, a related question for that right now you can find it at options if you haven't voted yet a little bit of time left on this one listeners we said there have been many debacles that left lasting impacts on the options market 87 crash long-term capital management the dot-com crash the great financial crisis just to name a few you can name many more i'll be just talking about vix mageddon there a bunch of others but that's just how many we could squeeze in <laughs> we said should we add the gamestop frenzy to that list and he gave you two simple choices yes it's a post GameStop world or no, this is a tempest in a teapot. Mr. Rhodes, as our guest, we'll start with you, sir. 
What is your vote, A? And then B, more importantly, what do you think our cool kids are voting for? Um, my vote is no. Uh, and, and I've kind of gone through why I think that already. Uh, and I'm going to hope, and, and you know, I just know that you have the smartest listeners on God's green earth. I'm going to say 80% are saying that it's, ju- that it's uh, a one-off event. Interesting. Interesting. Mr. Meatball, same question for you, sir. Where do you think GameStop ranks in the pantheon of market-altering events? And what do you think our audience is voting for? Well, I think it's a little bigger than a one-off event, uh, but it's not the Tempest in the Teapot either. But I'm going to say that our audience, uh, the pessimists that they are, are saying it's a (laughs) one-off event. Interesting. You know, in the early voting, it was pretty heavily in favor of, yes, it's a post-GameStop world. In the last, let's say, 12 or so hours, 24 hours, it seems like it has trended more no's coming in. So right now, it's about 53.8% yes, it's a post-GameStop world, and 46.2% saying no, Tempest in the teapot. So our audience is actually pretty split, which is kind of surprising. I have to come down on the yes, given all the things we've heard from a lot of these regulators. They all want their pound of flesh. There's going to be a lot of grandstanding. That usually equates to something impactful from a regulatory perspective, usually in a bad way. Look at all the other moral panics we've had about every decade or so listeners that regard short selling. We banned it briefly here about a decade ago. People forget about that, but we did do that here in the world's greatest economy. <laughs> we, we went crazy about short selling. So there are there is the possibility for a lot of that stuff coming down, a lot of ham-fisted regulation as both sides of the aisle have the bit in their teeth on this one. So I don't think We've seen the end of this. It's going to be probably some crackdown on the BDs as a result of this. So I do think this is going to be one of those events that's going to resonate for quite some time. Even though I hope, I hope that Miss Russell and the meatball are correct. I hope that I am deeply, deeply incorrect. And we've all forgotten about this in a few months' time. I don't think that is the case. So here's a, <laughs> here's a fun one. I, we get these weird ones whenever you're on, Russell. But this is kind of fun. This comes from Nix. Nix wants to know about VIX. So that rhymes. Nix says, at what point in VIX <laughs> do we say we don't care anymore <laughs> because we're all dead anyway? <laughs> I just like the way he phrases that question. This, to me, is kind of the analogy, the flip side of, you know, the old argument when I was out in the SPX and guys would blast away at like the S&P, whatever, 100, 200 puts for a couple of cents. And people would say, what the hell are you doing? And they would say, what does it matter? If we get down there, it doesn't matter. We're all dead anyway. <laughs> it's just kind of the same type of question. At what level to the upside is VIX where, you know what, it's dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. I'm going to say if we get to a thousand, if we get to a thousand in VIX, then yeah, you got other problems and uh, settlement and paying out on on VIX is going to be the least of your worries, Mister Mister Rhodes. <laughs> I just love these questions. What do you, what is your answer here for Mister Nix who wants to know about VIX? Triple digits, just a hundred. You think just a hundred? Yeah, That's it. And the and, uh, and the reason that I and, and where I come up with that number, um, and I do know that we topped a hundred in the VXO, which was the pre- when you look at what happened in eighty seven, um, but. In the modern era, like we talk about the modern era in baseball, in the modern era of VIX, uh, you know, the upper 80s has been it. And, and, you know, then everything starts to work itself out. I think breaching that level, closing significantly above that level, and that's where I came up with 100, uh, would, I think, indicate that market participants don't think, um, you know, the government can come, up, come in and fix it this time that whatever the big issue is, is going to persist longer than the normal volatility spike or might not be fixable. Interesting. So that, that's, where, that's where I come up with it. I mean, that's, again, using a little history there. So I, I could see touching VIX at 100 intraday, not sustained. You know? And by the way, before everyone writes in about my 1,000, I was joking. there. I know we've talked about it before with the theoretical upper band for VIX. Is, and it's, it's way below 1,000. So in terms of practical levels, it can actually reach. So that's why I said... A thousand, because if we get there, that that's insanity level beyond anything that is rational. Mr. Meatball, we have an interesting gulf here, an interesting market. 100 on the downside of Mr. Russell, and then my somewhat outlandish, absurd 1,000 to the upside. What is your number here for Mr. Nix? Where if you hear this number, you're forgetting all things about the markets and you're getting your go bag getting the hell out of Dodge. I mean, I think Russell's a lot closer, you know, somewhere somewhere north of 100. But yeah, we, we get over 100. I mean, the middle of COVID, it got to what, 87? That was an all time high. Um, you know, what would be worse than the entire economy shutting down? 
uh, you would need something. And uh, yeah, so I, th- I think we'd be talking 100, 120, something in that range. And, you know, call it 50% higher than the all time high. And you're looking at a, a at just, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's 90 degrees and snowing that, or, or it's, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, that, that's, that's what you're looking at in, uh, in, in something like that. Then the biblical plagues have been unleashed upon us all. So where do you come down as listeners? It's a fun question. Hit us up with your answer. You like my, uh, kind of crazy 1000. I think if we get there, I think we can definitely say we have a hundred. Yeah. We're pretty worried at that point already. That's getting pretty scary. But if you get 10x, <laughs> then all bets are certainly off. Hit us up with your thoughts, listeners, as we keep on rolling into that most difficult, as witnessed this week, the most difficult part of the show. It is time for the Crystal Ball. It's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store. It's time to look into the Crystal Ball. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Crystal Ball. Last week on the show was myself and the Rock Lobster doing double duty here. The Rock Lobster was feeling about a 29. Remember, we were at about a 35 and change at the end of the show last week. So we were both feeling some vol coming off, but not a ton. In fact, I remember telling the Rock Lobster I liked his level and I wasn't going to scum him, which is why I went up to about 29 and three quarters. The nice, charitable guy that I am. And it turns out none of that mattered <laughs> because we're seeing vol much lower, many, many handles lower than that level. Come in at the end of the show, we got spikes right around 21 and three quarters, and Bix Cash still holding right around that 21 handle out there. So you're talking eight handles <laughs> and about seven and a quarter on the most optimistic out there in spikes for the Rock Lobster. I was obviously even more out there. So outside of our one point margin of victory, listeners, that means that no one wins from last week, which means our guest. In the hasn't been on in a while, he gets to go first. So, Mr. Meatball, Mr. Meatball, I apologize, Mr. Once and Future Dr. Vix. Uh, you used to be the guy who would buy all the upside and Vix you possibly can when you're on the show every week. I got the feeling, I don't know, just call it uh, my spidey sense that you're going to go the other way this week, sir. So, what are you feeling this time next week? Um, you're gonna love it. I'm going for 18, and here's why. Uh, you know, the old uh, the, the old Sports Illustrated jinx, you're on the cover of SI, you're, you're screwed for the short term. Um, Bloomberg Business Week. This week, it's the volatility issue. That right there has got to indicate that the, uh, the, the, the 20s are going to be behind us. In the next <laughs> are they talking up more vol or just the fact that they're discussing? I don't volatility? know. I just saw the cover while we were on the air. But just the fact that it is the volatility issue um, leads me to believe that this is the end of uh, I, you know, I don't want to say uh, end of a high VIX regime, but because I do think that the the floor is going to be probably like 15, 16 at the most for some time until we get all this COVID stuff behind us. Uh, but I do think uh, next week you guys are going to be talking about the smart folks that bought puts uh, bought the February puts that already had a whole lot of a buffer in them because I think the teens are in our near future. Interesting. Interesting stuff afoot there. So he's fading what is for him the swimsuit issue, which is the the Bloomberg volatility issue. Mr. Meatball, I'll be charitable as well. You weren't on the show, so I won't have you share in the ignominy of your counterpart there, the Rock Lobster. You get to go next. What are you feeling for this time next week, sir? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with Russell, uh, but I, you know, since he went 18, I'll go... 1919. <laughs> Some might say a horrific year, <laughs> World War I, <laughs> horrible Spanish flu. So maybe an inauspicious pick there uh, from the meatball. But 1919 for the meatball. All right, so we're at 21 and three quarters or so on the spikes, about 21 or so on VIX. So a couple of points there for both of them. All right, so myself, like I said, we weren't feeling as much vol erosion as it was this week, I could certainly see the arguments for what these two are going on about with a little bit more downside. They've taken up a lot of the downside room, so I think I shall, once again, be the charitable host and go a little bit north. I'm going to say, hmm, I'm going to say we're going to be just, the question is above or below the 20 handle next week. And I'm going to say, because I'm such a nice guy, I'm going to say 
ever so slightly above it, even though in my heart of hearts, I want to be around 19 three quarters. I'm going to be nice. I'm going to give Meatball a little bit more room. So I'm going to say 20 and a quarter. There we go. So that's me on the upside. A 20 and a quarter. Mr. Meatball in the middle, 1919. And Mr. Rhodes playing the downside card, which is rare for him, at a whopping 18. All right, everybody. That music means we've come to the end of this sojourn through the world of volatility. But before we go, Mr. Rhodes, if folks are intrigued, maybe they want to pick up a book or two about VIX. Where should they go? What should they do, sir? Uh, the VIX Trader's Handbook is on um, – it's available on um, Amazon, like every book known to man. Uh, and uh, if you want to see things that I write about the market periodically – uh, my stuff is in front of the paywall at eqderivatives.com. There you go. Check out that VIX Traders Handbook. A good plug for some jerk out there I never heard of on that book. So uh, check it out if you are so inclined. And Mr. Meatball has written one or two books. Maybe some jerk on the, some of those books as well, plugging those things. And uh, Mr. Meatball, folks want to check out your books or perhaps they want to do a little bit of Robin Hooding. Where should they go? What should they do? You know, come to optionpit.com. I write a daily blog called The Vix Edge, and then I have a second blog called The Pit Report. Uh, they're going to be loaded with all kinds of actionable, wonderful ideas that uh, you can go right after as a trader. So go to optionpit.com, drop in that email, and uh, you'll be a happy camper. There you go, optionpit.com. Get on the list and then sit back and enjoy the deluge that will follow. And then, of course, you know where to go. For all things spikes, myaxoptions.com slash spikes. You know what you can find there. You can find the press releases. You can see what's going on with new products and new evolutions of spikes. You get all the data, the charts, the historical stuff. Get, of course, even a link to a cool show called Volatility Views. What more could you ask for? Myaxoptions.com slash spikes. And you know where to go to find out more about execution services and trading technology. Yep. It's matrixexecutions.com, the place to go for all that interesting info and a whole bunch more. And on behalf of everybody over there in Matrix, everybody over there in my axe land, Mr. Rhodes, the meatball, and indeed myself, I thank all of you for joining us. And we'll see you back next week for another episode of Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by MyAx, one of the fastest, most efficient trading platforms in the world. MyAx is proud to bring you Spikes Volatility products. Spikes options and futures are traded on the Spikes Volatility Index, Spike, offering pinpoint accuracy, radically faster dissemination, and a highly transparent settlement auction, all for ultra-low exchange fees. It's volatility reimagined. Learn more about spikes at myaxoptions.com slash spikes. Options and futures involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. The statements made are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied on for financial or legal advice. Volatility Views is also brought to you by Matrix Executions, LLC, an agency broker-dealer focused on best execution in trading workflow automation. A technology-driven firm, Matrix is led by trading pioneers with decades of experience designing and building best-in-class solutions for options markets. Matrix connects to all domestic exchange venues and multiple international exchanges and serves both institutional and individual clients. For more information on Matrix Executions, LLC, please visit MatrixExecutions.com. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash The Options Insider, or via questions at TheOptionsInsider.com. <laughs>